Good evening and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the August, I'm sorry, I'm already ahead of the August. <laughs> <laughs> Village Council meeting, take two. Good evening and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the June 20th, 2017 meeting of the Downersville Village Council. It is my privilege to call this meeting to order. There are copies of our agenda on either side of the room. If you haven't already done so, please pick up a copy. You can follow along with tonight's proceedings. There will be multiple opportunities for public comment both with respect to all the items that are on our agenda tonight, as well as a segment under item four, which is reserved for public comments of a general nature. And at that point in time, if any members of the audience have any questions or comments of a general nature with respect to things that are not on our agenda tonight, we would welcome you to please come to the podium at that time, tell us who you are, and we'd love to hear from you. But first, it is our proud custom to begin our meetings by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, so I'd like to ask everyone present to please rise and join us in reciting the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to ask our fine village clerk, April Holden, to please call the roll. Commissioner Wallace? Here. Commissioner Earl? Here. Commissioner Waldeck? Here. Commissioner White? Here. Commissioner Jose? Here. Commissioner Barnett? Here. Mayor Tully? Here, thank you very much. That brings us to item three, which pertains to minutes of past council meetings. We have one set of minutes to review and approve tonight. Those are our regular meeting minutes from our June 13th, 2017 council meeting. If there are no changes, corrections, or comments, I will entertain a motion to approve, please. Mayor Tully, I move that this council approve the meeting minutes from June 13th, 2017 as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Those minutes are approved. And lickety split, we're already at item four. This is where we entertain questions or comments of a public, na of public comments of a general nature with respect to items not on tonight's agenda. If any members of the audience have any questions or comments of a general nature with respect to things not on tonight's agenda, please get on the podium and we would welcome hearing from you. All right, great, we've got everyone here for specific questions, I like that. All right, we'll move right ahead to item five, which is our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Attorney, I move that this council approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Are there any questions or comments on any items on tonight's consent agenda from any members of the audience? Questions or comments from members of the village council? Hearing none, Mabber, roll call, please. Commissioner White? Aye. Commissioner Walden? Aye. Commissioner Wallace? Aye. Commissioner Earl? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Barnett? Aye. Mayor Tully? Hi, right, thank you. Our consent agenda passes unanimously. That brings us to item six, our active agenda. We have no items on tonight's active agenda, so we'll go right to item seven, which is our first reading or our workshop agenda. This is the portion of the meeting. It's a little more informal. This is where village staff is given an opportunity to present items for discussion purposes only to the village council for our consideration and any questions that we have. Uh, no formal or final action will be taken on any of these items tonight. But typically, the way we do it is we allow the presentation to be made, any petitioners to make their presentation, and then the village council will ask questions, and then we'll open it up for any questions or comments from members of the audience. And this is also customary. We usually ask our village manager, David Fieldman, to introduce each of the items, either directly or through one of the members of our outstanding village staff. Good evening, Mr. Fieldman. Good evening, Mayor Tully. Thank you. There are several items on tonight's first reading agenda. The first item, item A, uh, has to do with designing and proceeding with public sidewalks for construction in the Northwest Belmont area. This item will be presented by our Public Works Director, Nan Newland. And a uh, yes vote on this item would forward this discussion as part of the FY18 budget, where we would have the information as to how we could proceed with funding this project. So a yes vote means would be further considered at the time of the FY18 budget this fall. And Nan has further background information on this. Thank you. We appreciate that introductory clarification. Good evening. Good Ms. evening. Nolan, how are you? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the past several decades, the village has constructed public sidewalks on a proactive, prioritized <coughs> basis, which has supported a long-standing goal of the village to have sidewalk on at least one side of every street in the village. Um, and about 2015, we had reached over 95% of that goal and had sidewalk um, really throughout the village. Um, this was to enhance pedestrian safety um, and access throughout the village. In the summer of 2016, as I said, we have reached over that 95% level and it was decided to move to a petition uh, request system um, 
where we were getting into neighborhoods where we wanted people um, to be supportive of those sidewalks on those remaining streets. Um, and in 2016, we received two petitions from a uh, residential area. Um, it was ref one was related to traffic and one was related to sidewalks and what was referred to as the Northwest Belmont area. Um, this is bounded by Ogden Avenue to the north, Belmont to the east, uh, Burlington to the south, and uh, Walnut to the west, uh, the area identified here in orange. This area was uh, annexed to the village in 2012. And at the time that the, um, we went to the petition-based program, this area would have been the next one on the sidewalk program. Um, because of its ratings, um, this just, just, as we go into the area in yellow, is the area that currently does not have sidewalk. And because of its proximity to a number of very um, highly uh, walkable destinations, including the Belmont train station, Puffer School, and Ogden Avenue to the north, it did rank high in the priority listings as of 2015. As I said, we did receive a petition from this neighborhood. And as a result of that petition, we did take this um, item to the Transportation and Parking Commission in um, last fall um, to get more comments from the neighborhood and understand what their concerns were and what why they want a sidewalk and what, um, how to move forward with this. Um, we did incorporate it into neighborhood traffic study number five, which I'll discuss in the next item. And uh, we did go take this to tap then in um, April of 2017 um, to talk in more detail about it. The Transportation and Parking Commission did have a favorable recommendation to move forward with this item. And um, at that meeting, we did talk uh, as well as the meeting with the residents, we did talk about how sidewalks are constructed. These uh, slides are very similar to what we presented in prior uh, neighborhood meetings with um, neighborhoods. Um, this is typical of the streets, like in this section of the village that do not have curb and gutter. Um, it, the sidewalk would be located within the public right of way, um, about a foot off of the ditch line, of uh, the property line um, between the street and the ditch typically, and we would be positioning it to avoid trees with construction. Uh, we did go through this with the neighbors when we did meet with them and talk about the type of design process we typically have where we would come to them again with another neighborhood meeting to talk about design. Uh, we would uh, take a look at both sides of the street before we proceed. As um, we also talked to the neighborhood, there's a lot of concerns about drainage in this neighborhood as well as street condition. Um, so what we, um, if, the decisions made to proceed with design for this, uh, we think it makes sense to look at it at the same time that we look at drainage as well as street design incorporated into a comprehensive neighborhood design. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about this topic. Uh, thank you, Nan, appreciate it. And just for clarification, uh, if I understood what you said at the outset of your comments, had the village continued with its 20 plus year program of committing to put a sidewalk on at least one side of every street of the village, uh, which actually was hugely successful, uh, this would have been a natural next step on that on that list due to the same kind of ranking scores we had on what used to be known as the matrix? Yes. Okay. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, just for my own accord, um, I, I kind of hinted at it, so I'll, I'll explain <coughs> a little bit more. I think it was, was it Total Community Development 2? that led to a recommendation from the community a number of years ago that the village adopt a policy of investing in putting a sidewalk on one side of every street throughout the entire village to the extent reasonably possible and fiscally possible. And that program ran for about two decades and achieved incredible success by any measure in terms of the amount of coverage that was done and millions of dollars, many millions of dollars were spent on that program. Uh, the way it used to work was every year there would be a certain number of segments of the community that would be identified for sidewalk construction, uh, the design process, the neighborhood meeting process, and depending on resources, how much was available any given year, the council would decide how much to allocate towards it. There might be one, two, three, or maybe four, five, depending on the square footage that was involved, segments of the community that would receive sidewalks. The neighborhood meetings were always interesting because in some areas we would have unanimous support for sidewalks. In some areas we had unanimous opposition to sidewalks. And in many neighborhoods we had a mix. Some people wanted it, some people didn't want it, and everybody has uh, 
legitimate reasons for why they either like them or they don't like them. But it was because of the policy that we went ahead and, uh, with rare exception, put them in uh, even when there were oppositions for various reasons, since that was a community policy and not a <coughs> neighborhood level policy, which is something that's pretty important. Uh, so fast forward, as was mentioned by the village manager and our public works director, uh, we, after essentially having a very successful program, then switched to a petition-driven process, which is very similar to now how other traffic control devices are put in the various neighborhoods. Uh, the neighborhood will say, we'd like a change in the traffic, we'd like a stop sign, uh, and then we have a process, we have protocols <coughs> to go through. Uh, so this is, is this the first petition? Okay, that's why I'm going through this ancient history here. Uh, because this is the first petition-driven request that's come before us, and our commitment, uh, the council's commitment at that time was, as these come forward, we would take them up on an ad hoc basis, um, as opposed to having a certain amount of money put aside every year specifically for designated segments of what we used to be a long list of areas in the community that we were trying to work through to get sidewalks. Um, from my own standpoint, um, I, I, I don't see why we wouldn't explore this. That's why I asked the question about uh, if it's on the matrix and it would have normally been where we would have been going anyway given the ranking system that we used for many many years with adjustments certainly would want to consider it and then the question becomes um, the funding which was always an issue was how much money did we have available in any given year given other competing interests to do a capital project like this but I certainly would want to know what the cost would be what the time frame would be uh, to see whether and when we would go forward with it but I'm certainly willing to, to entertain it um, and we had always talked about bundling these projects back in the day. Um, if you're going to rip up the streets, you don't like to rip up the street and then rip it up the next year and the next year because you're doing sidewalks and then you're doing drainage and then you're doing something else. Um, you want to do it as a bundled project because you get more bang for your buck and it costs less and it disturbs the neighborhood once, not three, four times. Um, so if we were going to go forward with this, and I don't know what my colleagues think, but I'm certainly in favor of exploring it. Uh, seeing what the financial ramifications are and then also what the timing would be because I would want to do something like this in conjunction with other projects such as drainage. It just makes sense, uh, even if that means it happening a little bit later than if it was done as an isolated project. Uh, but I don't have any questions. I, I think I answered all my own questions in my little soliloquy there. <laughs> questions or comments from the council? Uh, Commissioner Waldeck? Yeah, real quick, uh, we got a lot of uh, remarks through the village website. Uh, there's not a lot of people in our audience tonight, but one way to let us know how you feel about issues is to comment on the uh, on the village website. We got a lot of comments, and I thank the folks for that. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. And I just want to point out uh, something I'll be talking about earlier, or later, excuse me. Commissioner Wallback, of course, is very smartly modeling the official that Village of Dyer's Grove shirt that will be worn at uh, Rotary Growth Fest this, later this week. And so he's uh, doing us all a favor and modeling how that will look. Look for those shirts later because if you have questions or comments for the members of the Village Council, we will have a uh, booth or a tent at Rotary Growth Fest, which starts, in, starts on Thursday. Um, so look for that shirt. Commissioner Wallach's modeling it for us tonight. But that's, that's why he's so attired. Commissioner Jose. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I don't want to necessarily repeat anything you said. I, I completely agree that uh, this is something we should explore. Uh, and I look forward to um, considering it further. I spent a fair bit of time in 2016 knocking in this neighborhood, and uh, I know that the streets are narrow and they do need uh, a little TLC, and that I think sidewalks would be a great benefit, especially with so many parks and uh, Belmont Prairie, the school. Uh, it, it just makes sense that this is something we can consider. So I'm on board. Thanks, man. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions, comments? Commissioner Barda? Uh, I'd just say that it, from my vantage point, if you look at the camp plan and its very re various revisions over the years or our pedestrian bike plans that we've talked about on and off, um, is that we've certainly adjusted the way we go at sidewalks, but from my vantage point, they're still a priority, and it becomes just a funding question, a funding and bundling question, Mayor, to the Mayor's point. Um, but Anytime there's a neighborhood that exhibits any interest at all, I'm very interested in trying to install them because I think they, uh, they speak to our village's long-term plans of, of accessibility and walkability and, and connectivity. Uh, they're critical to that. Thank you. All right, we'll pause and ask if there are any questions or comments from members of the audience with respect to this item. Good evening, welcome. 
evening, Mayor and Council. Do I have to say my name and address, I assume? The name's okay. always nice. <laughs> you know how to address you. You don't, you don't have to share your address. 2537 Indianapolis Avenue. Um, this is in reference to this uh, motion. I think it's 7416. Um, personally, my husband and I are strongly in favor of the sidewalks. We live in the area. It is a major safety concern. Um, I think a lot of what I was going to say tonight was already addressed by both your director and in your discussion already. The connectivity to the facilities in our neighborhood. Um, we would be able to connect to the Belmont Metro Station, the Prairie, the Rec Center, the golf course, and currently there's no safe way for the students that live in that area to walk to Henry Puffer Elementary. So that's kind of an interesting point too because I, I only live um, 0.55 miles from the school and they're bust, which is kind of ridiculous. But um, I think it would be nice as f in terms of health of the neighborhood, you know, sense of community, but also to connect us to all of the local facilities and amenities that we have. Um, I also want to thank the Department of Public Works for helping us in, in guiding us and getting the petition going and all the work they've done in facilitating and organizing the traffic studies to, to further pursue this as an option. And I would like to thank the Transportation and Parking Commission for formally recommending it and also Mayor and Council for your consideration on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Good evening, welcome. Hey, good evening, Aaron Cates. I just wanted to uh, come up here and say thank you for, uh, for addressing the safety needs in our neighborhood. And I just wanted to make sure to put myself on record as being very, very much pro sidewalks for the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Other questions or comments from members of the audience? Good evening, welcome. Hello, good evening. I'm Lauren Singdelson. I live at 2529 Indianapolis Avenue. And um, I think everyone here is pro sidewalk, so we don't want to parade up here one by one by one and take your time. So if everyone who's pro sidewalk wants to raise their hand and, and represent so that you know that we're here and that we feel very strongly about this and we'll do whatever we need to do um, in our neighborhood to help push this along. Um, the path to making our neighborhood safer. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, conciseness and efficiency of the delivery of comments. Um, what, one thing that I'll also mention, uh, if and when we were to go forward with the design and installation of sidewalks in this area, uh, as is the case every time we've done it, where people really get interested in it is when they see the plans and where it would go and how it would impact trees and how close it's to their house. That tends to get more, most attention. But I will say that uh, I've been pretty darn proud with the way the village has tried to address those things within reason. There are certain things you, you, you have to do from an engineering standpoint and otherwise, um, and safety and ADA requirements, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, in terms of being creative and trying to minimize the impact on the neighborhood and yet provide that safe path of walking to and from important areas, I, I'd say we've been pretty successful with that over the years. Um, but, but there's always some concern when folks see where the concrete ribbon will go. Um, wouldn't be our first rodeo in dealing with that over the last 20 years. But thank you for coming out and sharing uh, your views with us. Appreciate it. And I'm really glad to see how this process is working. This is the first petition-driven request that's come up. And uh, I'm glad to see that it, it is, in fact, working as intended. Thank you. Yes, please. Good evening, welcome. Uh, yes, uh, Wayne Anderson, 4805 Cross Street. Um, one question first. Is the next item on the agenda the one about stop signs in Area 5? Yes. Okay, well then I'll get to that on that one. So, um, at this point in time, uh, I'd just like to say uh, one suggestion I have, uh, seeing as they say our streets aren't that wide, aren't that safe, and all kinds of other things. Uh, I suggest uh, that the bike route be changed. Right now it runs on Burlington to Cross Street, then Cross Street through the residential area to Ogden Avenue. Uh, they ride about three abreast, sometimes four abreast, talking, not paying any attention. Luckily no one's been hit or anything. Uh, they disobey every stop sign there is, so that's nothing. But I'm just suggesting instead of Burlington and then going down Cross Street through the residential area, the bike route be changed and they keep going on Burlington to Walnut and then Walnut to Ogden. And uh, 
there's more open land. They get to see several parks and vacant fields and a few things down there. But uh, it would, uh, should we say, take them off a possibly injured list. And at this point in time, without sidewalks, uh, you've got the bikers, which are silent, and you've got the walkers, which are silent, and neither one can hear each other. So uh, just my suggestion at this point in time, just reroute the end of the bike route, take it off across street, put it on Walmart. So, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you sharing your suggestions with us. Other questions or comments on this item from members of the audience? Well, we appreciate everybody who shared their thoughts with us. Any further questions or comments from members of the council? Over here, Mike. Just so I understand the procedure and the timeline here, um, with an affirmative vote at our next meeting, at that point, staff will do the design and after doing that work they'll be able to to, to, to to present with us a budget a timeline how can we bundle with with other projects so what you're asking for this evening and next week on the next meeting at the vote is authority to go ahead and gather that information is that correct it's it's an information gathering and a preliminary design okay. i don't think it'll be a final design by that time but nope. it'll be enough information to make an informed decision about budget choices right. and resource so, allocation right. so, 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 so the, at that point then we'll we'll, 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 we'll build a certain expenditure in the budget and the work would actually get done sometime in 18. is that Assuming that, that, I mean, that's that's not it set could. in stone, it's it's set, set in concrete. It could. It may be a multi-phase project. We're, we're just going to have to look at the whole project and see how our, what the budget is and what makes sense from a right. phasing standpoint. So the next step is really to get that information for our consideration in terms of the preliminary is basically you're taking square feet of concrete multiplied by how many square feet to give you a rough cost idea, labor, preparation, et cetera, et cetera. It's not the actual uh, where it's going to go in topography necessarily. Uh, but then the phasing, bundling, we have an idea of, of cost and what the recommendations would be in terms of um, how that would be done before we would actually go forward with it. I totally and 100% support doing the gathering information necessary so that we can include this in the budget, 110%. All right, well, I don't think anybody can follow that. So they won't. <laughs> and so we'll move to the right, next. Thank you. The next item, as Mr. Anderson noted, is a related item in the same neighborhood. It's neighborhood traffic study number five, uh, and Nan will also present information on this item. Yes, an ordinance has been prepared to amend sections of the municipal code concerning the modification to traffic control on various streets, as well as neighborhood traffic study area number five, which is this same area. We received two petitions from the same time in this neighborhood. One was specifically related to sidewalks, and one was related to traffic operations. So we've been working on both of those items. Uh, the first thing I'd just like to cover, at their May TAP meeting, the Transportation and Parking Commission considered the change to traffic regulation at these six intersections. These are currently uncontrolled intersections. These are not in the same neighborhood. These are uh, in various locations throughout the village. Uh, we have been uh, kind of systematically looking at uncontrolled intersections throughout the village. Uh, these six were either re requested by um, neighbors, residents, or uh, suggested by staff. And they were reviewed by Transportation and Parking Commission at their May meeting. Um, there was, uh, some people came to talk and support and talk about each of them. And um, TAP did uh, forward a positive unanimous recommendation to change the traffic regulations for the six intersections as included in the packet. Um, the next item was considered at the April meeting, and that is neighborhood study number five, which we've just talked about. It's the same area, as I said. Um, as you're um, aware, this is, as uh, we've done four prior studies, uh, the purpose of them is to look holistically at traffic operations throughout a neighborhood. So we, we um, define a, a boundary that makes sense from a traffic standpoint. We take a lot of traffic counts. We review the existing traffic control within that neighborhood. We look at pedestrian safety, we, tra we count uh, pedestrians, uh, we take some turning movement counts at some of the bigger intersections, and um, then we have meetings and present the preliminary findings to the neighborhood to get their input as well. Um, this, uh, as you can see on the west side of town, is our fifth study area. The other areas highlight show you the other areas in the village we have looked at in the past five to six years. And as you see, they, they're generally between Ogden Avenue and Maple Avenue in the downtown, where we tend to see more um, 
cut through traffic, uh, concerns about speeding, um, people who are getting off the main arterials um, and going on to neighborhood streets. So that's primarily where we get the complaints from residents, where there's a perception or a reality of people who are cutting through local streets to get to their destination. The concerns expressed by neighbors in the petition and at the meetings were pedestrian related, which we have been addressing, um, talking about sidewalks and crossings, um, intersection, traffic uh, intersection traffic control, and speeding, as I said. Um, the key findings that we found after conducting the um, counts was that traffic volumes themselves are within the established range for local streets. We didn't find anything that was really out of, out of what we'd expect for that area. Um, the traffic volumes on the collectors, which are Burlington and Walnut, were also within the established range for those types of streets as well. So the volumes, um, even though we have a pretty um, intense use there with a lot of commuters parking, uh, we didn't find anything out of, kind of out of what we'd expect to see with volumes going through that neighborhood. We did find on a couple of streets, the, the average speeds were a little bit higher than what we'd like to see, and we're hoping to help address that with some of the traffic controls we're, we're talking about. Or if, that, if we don't see a, a noticeable reduction in that, we'll proceed with some traffic calming that was also discussed in the study. Um, staff's recommendations and the study recommendations that we found was to provide traffic control at all intersections. There currently are 15 intersections in that neighborhood that have no traffic control. And um, there's a few kind of nuances in this neighborhood. We have um, kind of an interesting S-curve there at Cross Street. Um, we have a few challenges. We have kind of a half right away in a couple of locations um, to work toward um, as we work on improvements like sidewalks um, and some of the traffic controls we're putting in place. So there's a couple of unique features in this neighborhood. Uh, we're also uh, recommending putting in some enhanced pedestrian signage, and those are included in the ordinance that's proposed and in the study you'll see. Um, and then at following implementation, we're recommending some follow-up speed and volume controls. Uh, this is uh, included in the staff report. This is the locations we're recommending changes. We are looking to convert one two-way stop at Haddow and Edward, which is also the entrance to the golf course, to a four-way stop. Uh, we're looking to um, put in a number of two-way stop controls throughout this neighborhood as well as some one-way stop controls where there is none currently. There um, are other, and this is just a graphical depiction of that that's included on the Village's <coughs> website and in your packet. Um, there are a number of other recommendations. Um, as a resident commented about the uh, recommendation for a bike route, um, they are recommending kind of an on-street, uh, they call it a shero, which is a, a lane, mar uh, not a lane marking, but a, a stripe that kind of indicates bicycle-friendly street. Uh, we are not recommending implementing those at this time. We'd like to get the traffic control in place, get the sidewalk design moving forward so we have a better idea how the whole neighborhood's going to work together and um, then move forward with some of the medium and long-term recommendations for the neighborhood. So at this time, we're recommending approval of the traffic control changes as well as pedestrian crosswalks that were shown as short-term improvements in the study. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Appreciate the presentation. Uh, questions or comments from members of the council with respect to Commissioner Barnett? Thanks. <clears throat> um, am I correct that the uh, conceptual pedestrian refuge design on Belmont from KLOA is not part of the current recommendation? That's still a conceptual thing. At Belmont and Prairie, Prairie mm -hmm. no, it is not. We have made uh, worked with the county who made changes in the signal operation, right? And um, that's been working very well. Um, they wanted to give us some ideas to consider in the future if we wanted to look at some additional changes. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner. Other questions or comments from members of the council? Thank you for all the work that went into it. Questions or comments from members of the audience with respect to the traffic control devices, please. It's a good thing you sat in the front row, Mr. Anderson. It's a wise choice. Welcome yep. back. Always get the front row in church and the front row at the council. So. <laughs> Okay, uh, as far as the cost goes, last year they did a preliminary sidewalk estimate, uh, and the estimated cost of the sidewalks at that point in time were $311,000. Uh, 
for the sidewalks in our neighborhood, okay? Uh, also, uh, the people that had the petition to uh, request sidewalks, uh, so far all they're getting are some stop signs. Uh, when we had the meeting in April, uh, we were told that uh, because the sidewalks might create a problem with drainage and then also seeing as our streets are starting to look like they were shelled over in the Syrian conflict, uh, uh, that they were going to come up with a comprehensive plan and uh, they would be working on it. And then this summer they'd have the plan in place and then they'd be able to start letting out contracts. But I see this is going to stretch on. So unfortunately, the people who want sidewalks for their children, uh, their kids may be in college by the time that they get them. But anyhow, uh, going to this uh, thing that they brought up before about putting a stripe down so that people know that's for bikes. I think before we do any of that, we need to do some striping on the streets where the center lines and the lane lines are worn out and then usually after you can't see them for one or two years, then they get repainted. So that's just my <coughs> thing on that, okay? Uh, also, uh, at the last meeting, I asked what the cost of the traffic study from the consulting firm COLA, I think it's K-O-L-A, cost and that was $14,000. Uh, I have a hard time digesting that because they came up with the report and the plan and had stop signs where you could put stop signs almost anywhere thinkable. And uh, now uh, basically it's boiling down to these stop signs other than the uh, four-way stop at the golf course entrance. Uh, they are going to put stop signs wherever there's a T intersection uh, on the streets. And uh, between Haddow and Burlington, there's a lot of residential streets run for one block. Uh, Edwards, Rose, uh, Puffer, and such. Uh, some of those streets for years have had a stop sign maybe at one end, not at the other end. Some have nothing. And at the meeting in April, uh, according to the consulting firm, uh, according to the guidelines by whatever council it is on traffic safety, traffic control or whatever, uh, it's pretty much semi-written in stone that wherever there's a T intersection, you should have a stop sign. Uh, on these streets now, that's part of this stop sign uh, placement package that's coming up, uh, where all of those streets are going to have stop signs at both ends, all right? Uh, my question is, uh, on that, if this is something that's kind of a town, city, uh, nationwide kind of general guideline, uh, how come all these years went by where a lot of those streets had none or one stop sign? Uh, Shouldn't the village have picked up on that as part of their uh, traffic planning or traffic engineering or traffic control or something? It just seems that uh, I don't quite understand why it cost $14,000 to have a consulting firm come in and look at things which a lot are just common sense maybe or the norm and then recommend them and then we're going to do them when we could have done them I hate to say it, without spending $14,000. As far as the traffic flow went, uh, they did that last fall. Uh, in the early summer, I was in the front yard, unfortunately, having a cigarette. <clears throat> and the village public works truck pulled up, and the guy came out and took the plastic thing and slapped the traffic counter down in the street. And I asked him, oh, what's that? And he says, oh, we're counting the traffic, and we'll traffic count it for two days during the week and get a traffic count. And afterwards, I saw we had a traffic count. The year before, I saw a thing with a traffic count. So, and again, I don't know why we needed a traffic count. So, uh, 
that pretty much covers everything. Uh, I don't mind paying taxes. You know, I don't enjoy it. I don't mind it. But I don't mind paying taxes when, should we say, the money is spent frivolously, uh, which unfortunately, this is my opinion. I could be wrong, and I might be. I just don't think we got no $14,000 our money's worth on it. And I don't think we really needed that study because the village departments on their own could have come up with all the same answers. Uh, the other thing is, um, this started out as sidewalks. So far all it is is getting a few stop signs. And uh, I hope they're working on the comprehensive plan because uh, so far it's just all piecemeal. So that's my say. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. In reverse order, obviously we just had the discussion about the sidewalks and we're going to be looking further into that. Uh, that piece yeah. will be for the sidewalks go. I'm not for or against right now because there is no plan as to where they're going. That's what we all want to see before we decide where to go forward. Um, and the traffic study, I, I suspect that uh, while it may have ended up saying what it was going to say, that a lot more was looked at to determine whether more needed to be done than what it was ultimately done. And the other piece of it is that um, this thing about liability, where you put traffic control devices, and it's very important to have a well-documented, re well-researched basis for making uh, traffic control decisions in many situations. Um, because of the guidelines and the benchmarks that exist. So it's always wise to have that. But sometimes even if you, uh, the traffic study says you don't need to add anything, you, you know that that's the case rather than a study that might have come out and said you need more or less. Uh, so I suspect that the, there was probably more benefit to it than may have met the eye, is my only point. Uh, quite frankly, compared to some traffic studies I've seen, that's pretty, expensive, pretty inexpensive. Uh, so I don't think it was frivolous at all, but uh, I can certainly understand uh, the uh, untrained eye, it might look like it wasn't wasn't much, uh, but thanks for your comments. Uh, other questions or comments on item B from members of the audience? <coughs> yes, sir, welcome. Hello, uh, Adam Carey. Um, I don't have a problem with any of the stop signs except for the S curve, which I know she said was a uh, unique area or a unique space for us. Um, it was brought up in the last meeting we discussed, and it was one thing that they recommended or heard our discussions on, is really not a place needed for stop signs. I just wanted to make a note of that, because if you stop there, you can't see the other side. So stopping there, uh, different weather conditions, you're on a hill to start with to start back up when you can't even see the other lane of traffic coming at you. So there's really not a need there for a stop sign. From my understanding, people lived in the area for 30 years. There's never been an accident there. There's never been an issue with it. I think it would create more of a problem for having to make people stop there before continuing when you can't see the other side anyway. Right. So that was all. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that information from the field. There's an old adage that goes something like this. First, do no harm. We certainly don't want to make things worse than they already are. The idea is to try to be responsive to the neighborhood's wishes and, and make it better. But th thanks for sharing that personal experience. Good evening, welcome. Hi, um, Scott Rogers. So um, quick thing, I think at the last meeting they did take out the stop signs at the S-curve, or at least that was the proposal. So hopefully that made it through to whatever you saw because I would agree that we don't need it there. Um, the other thing that's not in this study but we talked a lot about is uh, the Hertz dealership that is at the corner of Drendel and Ogden. So they dumped a bunch of gravel on the road and they park overnight on our street. And we've tried to bring that up in numerous Places, so I figured I'd address it here um, since if you guys can't fix it, I don't know who can. Um, but they park overnight on Drundle, both sides of the street, um, all the time. And I think most people here would agree with that. So okay. I'm in favor, I guess, of all that, but I would agree. So I, uh, a lot of the stop signs are, you kind of know you have to stop there where they're putting them up, but it's fine. That's it. And Thank I, you. Appreciate you sharing that. And uh, appreciate you bringing up the gravel on the overnight parking. We can certainly take a look at that. Other questions or comments from members of the audience? Well, thank you for everyone who spoke. Other comments or questions from members of the council on this item before we move on? 
Very good. Thank you. Move on to item 7C, please. The remaining items on the first reading agenda all have to do with the adoption and updating of our building codes to the 2015 International Code Series. You may recall that Director Popovich presented information on these items at our last council meeting. Uh, we have no further presentation, but you may recall that one of the major policy issues uh, to talk about was the 2015 code requirement for uh, fire sprinklers in new single family home construction. And we're very much looking forward to council discussion on that and any other items uh, related there too. And staff is here to answer any questions that you may have. Great, thank you. Well, it sounds like our charge is to express our preferences on the uh, Insta the requirement of sprinklers in new single-family residential construction. I understand the charge. Commissioner Waldeck, right out of the box. Uh, let's see, before we get into the sprinkler part, I would like to address something that I brought up last week and thank staff for uh, trying to put together uh, the list of triggers. As a matter of fact, the introduction, you know, and avoiding the use of the word triggers, uh, it came out to be several lines. It's very complex, but it's a, uh, a situation that you often hear, not just in Downers Grove, but wherever you go, uh, where there's a municipality with codes uh, and things that have to be met. And so somebody starts a home improvement project and they hear the dreaded words, you need to bring it up to code. And it starts turning a simple project into you know, a major, a major costly remodel. And so I was interested and I asked staff about what triggers, uh, what makes these projects more expensive, when, when do you have to bring things up to code? And uh, uh, they responded quite well. And uh, it's in the council responses, so if anybody uh, is interested, especially those who want to start uh, home improvement projects, uh, they might want to take a look at it. Uh, my concern was that the adoption of a new code, uh, we're currently at 2006 and we're gonna adopt a 2015 code. How does that trigger, uh, you know, what types of triggers are set when you start doing these projects? And staff came up with a very good explanation. Uh, you know, there are times, you know, for safety and uh, uh, when you compromise safety, uh, you, need, you need to make changes. Uh, when your house was built, if, you, if your residence was built uh, under a different code or the 2006 code, you're kind of held to that code, and a lot of times those codes uh, aren't met uh, when the uh, residence was uh, constructed or changes have been made. So you do have to bring things up to the code that existed at the time it was built. And then there's a few other changes. So anyway, I just recommend to the public to uh, to look at those responses and uh, not be so afraid to go out and get uh, the needed permits and try and uh, try and work around getting permits, uh, which which could result in uh, some serious disasters. Which brings us into the sprinkler uh, discussion. But anyway, it was just something I brought up last week, and and I thought staff did a really good job, and I recommend everybody look at it. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, you're on a roll. Sprinklers? You've already segued. <laughs> you want me to kick it off? Okay. Go for it. All right. Uh, oddly enough, when, when we were talking about this uh, last week, I don't know if it was Tuesday or Wednesday, I can't remember now, or, or in between, uh, there was that terrible fire in, in, in London. And if you looked at that, you know, you, you know how important safety is, and maybe if they had sprinklers, we don't know what the cause was. Uh, but you recognize that, you know, maybe in those situations, sprinklers could have could have saved a lot of lives. Uh, I had asked about uh, a, a situation in uh, one of our senior uh, homes that uh, where a false alarm uh, was triggered, uh, a sprinkler went off did a lot of damage and, and a number of residents were displaced for a period of time while they were making repairs. So when you put in a sprinkler system, you have the safety, uh, you know, fire safety, but you also have the, the danger of water damage. And uh, 
I think for residential homes, we require, uh, we require the alarms. Uh, sprinkler systems are, are expensive. Uh, they add a lot of cost to a new residence. They also have to be maintained uh, and inspected. And, you know, you're risking a possibility of fire. And you're also risking the possibility of a lot of water damage. And I've seen, uh, seen the sprinkler go off and how much water can go, uh, can be dispersed in a very short period of time. Uh, what was it, 13 gallons a minute or something like that? But uh, boy, that adds up and it can do a lot of damage. And I think, uh, I think it should be up to the resident or whoever's building the home at the time, and this is just my opinion, uh, at the time of construction, uh, there should be maybe a requirement to make an active choice as to whether there should be sprinklers or not. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're a builder, uh, you make that choice. Uh, I think, I think the idea that some thought was put into this, uh, there ought to be a sign-off sheet or something in the, in the process that says that it was thought of. If there, if a builder's building a home for, uh, for a particular party, uh, you know, it's already solved and they're building it for them, uh, that the new owners should recognize that they have a choice. They should be maybe given a, uh, an estimate on how much a sprinkler system is, uh, the, uh, the advantages and disadvantages, and let them actively make a, a decision as to whether they want it or not. And for myself, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to require having a uh, sprinkler system installed on on all residential, I think it should be a owner's choice, and that'll kick it off. So, who's next? <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Who doesn't want to be next, Commissioner Jose? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I do respect uh, property rights, obviously, but uh, I, I think the safety aspects in this particular case outweigh them. <clears throat> uh, to talk specifically about costs, since that was mentioned. Uh, According to the staff report from last week, the National Association of Home Builders um, in 2016 reported that the average cost per system nationwide was about $6,000. Uh, Westmont uh, collected quotes from a number of contractors and found the range to be between $7,400 and about $13,000, depending on how big the home is. And the, uh, the homes ranged from 2,800 square feet to 5,800, almost 5,900 square feet. Um, <clears throat> when you're building a home of that size, it's going to cost a fair bit of money, and uh, I don't think that 7,400 to about 13,000 uh, is too large a cost to bear, especially when the uh, potential downsides are uh, you know, quite catastrophic. I mean, uh, in the past five years, we've had 38 fires in single-family homes. Uh, 17 of them have resulted in damage of more than $100,000. The rest of it's in the staff report from last week. I won't read through it. Um, the Illinois uh, Association of Fire Chiefs and many other fire professionals has come out in favor of this, uh, and I, I see no reason not to take their recommendation. They're the professionals that um, tell us in these situations um, what is recommended, what is safe, and what is most safe. And uh, I think uh, we owe it to our residents to make sure that new construction homes are as safe as they can be in this aspect. And we owe it to our fire professionals that uh, you know, we run into uh, a burning building to hopefully save us. And, and God knows, I, I hope and I know everybody up here hopes that it never comes to that for anyone. But uh, I think this is a small price to pay for a tremendously large potential benefit. So I'm in favor. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Earl. Well, I'm kind of on the other side of the fence, interestingly. Um, I actually had the unpleasant um, honor of, of watching my childhood home burn. And um, fortunately, my parents got out alive. The sprinkler system would have made no difference in that case. Um, the fire came in and was in the walls from the outside of the house and never set off the smoke alarms, never would have set off the, the fire sprinklers. Um, ironically, my parents were 
forced to install a fire sprinkling system when they built their new house 15 years ago. And it was a financial burden. Um, it needed to be maintained at the tune of $150 every year. Um, if it wasn't done, it was up to the city to have to go after them for proof of, of uh, pressure testing and in inspections. Um, and that was a, a yearly burden, not just um, you know a choice they could make. It was something they was forced upon them, and they they felt very negatively towards it. And um, and I, I hate, I, I, I would rather you, you could choose them if you would like them. Um, I don't have any objection to putting um, in something like Naperville has where they adopted it, but there's two exits and there's um, some extra fire safety stuff done so that they, um, you know, that you don't have to go with sprinklers. Um, I don't have any objections to that, but just flat out to require sprinklers, I am not in favor of. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Wallace. I'll, I'll go right off that. I asked a lot of questions regarding sprinklers and learned more than I ever thought that I would. Um, so at this point, I am also interested um, in doing what Commissioner Earl said. Um, at first, I was all about the sprinklers due to the safety, due to the recommendations. And then I asked all these questions and saw how much the annual cost would be to someone who had sprinklers in their home. And because of that, it turned me off a little bit to it. So I really like what Naperville and Wheaton did. Um, Naperville included the requirement, but then provided those exceptions. Wheaton removed the requirement, but did an amendment. So I feel like either way, I would be comfortable with with something like that, which I think of in my mind as more of a hybrid of uh, these two different takes here. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Barnett, Commissioner White, let's flip a coin. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Barnett. Yeah, I'm still processing this, but I'm kind of reluctant right now uh, to compel the fire um, sprinkler systems. The, the um, you know, there's always a point um, where something can be compelled and, and add to safety. I mean, we could we could compel fire stops as well. There's a variety of things that could be employed, and and I guess I uh, I struggle with us adding continually sort of adding burden um, to kind of in, internal, if you will. I mean, Greg makes a point that I think is worth considering, which is why I'm, I'm still sort of digesting this about our, our fire professionals and, and the role, the effect it play, has on them. But um, beyond that, I'm really reluctant to, to do much inside the building. Um, we do a lot now, and, and certainly that's evolved and has grown over time. But as we add cost that only affects the occupants of the building, I guess I'd like that to be their choice as, as often as possible. It's, it's in my mind, it's different than things external to the building um, where it affects others. And, and so that's where that Greg's comments are, are you know, giving me pause. But the costs are real there. And, and the safety thing is, is, I think, sometimes too lo loosely thrown around. And, and I don't mean that to sound um, disparaging anybody who, who sees this as, as a professional choice. but there is always another safe element that could be compelled and always something additional that can be added. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that sprinklers are reliable. I mean, I'm not swayed so much by the potential failure. Sprinklers are really reliable. Um, and they're, for every failure, there's a million that aren't failing. Um, and they're effective. There's no doubt about their effectiveness. That said, what's the population of homes in Downers Grove that has sprinklers? What's the population of homes that had fires that had sprinklers? I don't think it's it's really a a um, as much of a sort of blanket panacea as we might suggest, and, and it feels like a pretty heavy burden. Uh, so it, I'm inclined right now to do what it takes to remove that requirement, um, but I'm still kind of processing some of Greg's comments. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner White. Well, actually, I'm I'm, I'm probably close to where. Commissioner Barnett is right now, but I think I'm leaning towards not having a requirement 
for sprinklers, and I'll go and we'll go in more of the details in a minute. But I very much like the suggestion made by Commissioner Waldeck that as part of the building permit application, the applicant check a box saying that the pros and cons of sprinklers have been considered before the filing of this application. So that then the builder makes it, in, you know, that we have something on record that the person that filed for the permit made a conscious decision whether or not to install sprinklers. And there could be a pamphlet, the pros and cons of sprinklers. Um, some of the things like, first of all, actually, I meant to say this first. These comments are addressed solely to single family homes or perhaps duplexes. Especially with our prior approval of type three, absolutely and positively, we need full recommended sprinklers for any multifamily building. The things that have happened in England in the substandard building codes, um, we, 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 especially in multifamily building, we simply have to protect people. So I'm talking only about single family homes. And I'm not really ready to require, I, I'm ready to say that the applicant needs to make an informed, we, the, the village should get proof the applicant made, that's just a form, that they made an informed choice. Um, then it, and part of what concerns me is the follow-up regulation, because the danger of accidental, the sprinkler going out, going off accidentally, or it leaks, um, annual pressure testing, things like that can be burdensome. And I can imagine a situation where a homeowner who didn't want sprinklers would find a way to shut it off. And then we have no way of knowing that it's even on. You know, I think about in the context of stormwater, the Y valve, where when, when, when the inspector comes, oh, it's, it, it's going out to the sump pump. The inspector leaves, it goes back into the sanitary sewer. I mean, that's not a big problem in, in Downers Grove, but in other c c communities, you can't sell a house without that being inspected. So my, my concern with single family homes is, is enforcement. You know, how do we make sure that they're properly maintained after the fact? And do we write tickets if they don't turn in once a year a form saying they had a plumber look at, you know, that, that, I think that, that takes us down a path I'm, uh, I'm not ready to go down right now. So as far as some of the things that were done in Wheaton and uh, other t in Naperville, well, what, what I think about that is that if those types of changes make sense from a fire safety perspective, they should just be in the code. You know, if, if, if you're putting gypsum board on the underside of, of a stairway or adding a heat sensor in the garage is a good, safe thing to do. The fact that it's not in the code suggests to me that the national consensus is those particular items may not be as important as they think. But if that's really a good thing to do, you should just do it. And, you know, and that's not a reason to avoid sprinklers. You just, you just should do it. You should put gypsum board on underside your stairwells. I don't know from, from, from a fire safety point of view to, to the extent to which that is true or not. So I think um, have it my, the, the condition or the exception of the small little you know, thing would be that every building code applicant for single family home has to sign a form saying that they have considered the pros and cons of sprinklers before, be, before submitting their plans. And I think in some ways that helps um, pr pr protect the village from liability because we're saying you should think about this before you make your decision, but we'll let you make the decision. So that's pretty much where I'm at right now. Thank you. And as I think I mentioned when this first came up, uh, this has come up multiple times over the last 15, 20 years. And uh, we are, to be absolutely clear, it's worth repeating, only talking about single family residential homes. Uh, different story in multifamily. It, 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 it always for me is an issue of the incremental burden versus the incremental benefit. And I just continue to be unconvinced that the incremental benefit with all the other improvements in materials and protocols, um, it justifies the, the incremental cost, which is not only significant but reoccurring. It's not just the installation. Um, and that there are other improvements in materials, design, and whatnot that um, there is a, there already is and has been a more substantial incremental benefit for, for the burden. Uh, so I remain unconvinced that it's necessary. I, I'm open to some of the other hybrid creative approaches that have been pursued by the communities. Um, if that's the topic of discussion, I wouldn't rule that out. But in terms of mandating that uh, sprinklers be installed in all new single family residential construction and substantial remodelings is not something that I'm convinced is, is necessary. Um, 
similarly, and not to, to rely upon analogies, uh, you're, you're safer with a monitored alarm system with cameras in your home too, and yet we don't require that everybody has that in every home that is built. Again, to echo the comments of some of my colleagues, it's a matter of choice. Um, if you wish to do that, you can. Some do, some don't. Um, but uh, if there are other things that, uh, that, that might at a lower incremental, cost, lower incremental burden and greater incremental uh, benefit, uh, would, would achieve some of the first responder issues that Commissioner Jose mentioned, uh, by all means, I'd be open to considering that. But on the question that's at, at hand, uh, I'm, I'm still not convinced. I do want to. I do, I do, do want to want, want, want to respond to something though, which I think it sounds like there might be a misunderstanding. My understanding with the development of materials actually argues very much in favor of sprinklers. It's not enough to push me over the edge, but the engineered wood, wood products are often glued with petroleum-based products, and houses built in the last 20, 30, 40 years burn a whole lot faster than houses built 30, 40, 50 years ago. That, and, and, and then the furnishings are often made with petroleum products. So the contents of the, so, so the idea that materials somehow make homes more safer, from a fire perspective point of view, the building materials are far less safe from fire perspectives than they were 100 years ago. Nonetheless, I don't, I think that we really don't want to, I mean, a, a, a house will go up almost instantly now compared to the way it would go up 50, 100 years ago. Um, but, but it doesn't change anything I said earlier, and, and I was totally aware of all of that be, 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 be before I made my, 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 my earlier comments that the possibility of people to shut it off, the leaking, and you know, I think each, each individual building permit applicant should make the decision for themselves. You're obviously not building homes out of reclaimed wood then. Those that can afford it do so. <laughs> there you go. We're all about preservation. Yeah. Any other comments? Commissioner <coughs> Waldeck? Yeah, uh, regarding the failure of sprinkler systems, in my quick research, uh, there's like an inst there's always an association or an institute of some kind, and, and this was uh, sprinkler installers, and it was a short article on uh, telling and warning the installers on how to avoid liability should they install something that accidentally goes off when it shouldn't and cause a lot of water damage. That kind of set off an alarm in, in my mind that, uh, you know, if the people who are installing have to worry about liability about accidental uh, sprinklers going off, uh, that's one thing. And then with all the water damage that's possible, uh, like I said, it, it was a multi-family uh, home that went off, or not home, but uh, building. Uh, people were displaced. I mean, there was an awful lot of water damage. Well, you get that in a single family home, you're going to put in an insurance claim, and quite honestly, dealing with insurance companies, uh, they have a, a contract to cash your check when you send in a premium. They're not so quick on paying off. And so, uh, recovery for all that damage, and I, and I think that needs to be added as a conscious decision of, a, of the owner to decide what, you know, name your poison. Do uh, you want to take the chance on water damage or do you want to take the chance on fire? So uh, that's why I, I think an informed decision is, uh, is best and leave it up to them and not require it. Thanks. Thank you. Going once, going twice. Questions or comments from the audience? You really want to weigh in on that one? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Council. Very informative. We will uh, have the uh, ordinances prepared for the next Council meeting on these items. And with that, that ends our first reading agenda. <coughs> thank you very much. Appreciate that, Mr. Fieldman. That brings us to item eight, the Mayor's Report. And of course, there is only one thing that is dominating the Mayor's Report today, <laughs> and that is the palpable excitement that is just in the air. You still think you can cut it with a knife with respect to the uh, advent of Rotary Grove Fest, which returns to the streets of the Village of Donners Grove this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We have the ride preview that begins on Thursday, <coughs> and then uh, the real activity starts on, on Friday. Uh, often billed as the largest block party in town, it's a great opportunity for everyone to come out, see their friends and neighbors, 
have a good time, listen to some great music, have some good local and not so local food, and of course, uh, visit all the businesses that are in downtown as well. Uh, if you want to look at the lineup, uh, would visit, I would encourage you to visit uh, www.rotarygrowthfest.com. Uh, I can't even use the counter anymore because there's only one hour, one day and three hours until Rotary Growth Fest begins, of course, this Thursday. So we all of us look forward to seeing many of our friends and uh, colleagues out there. Um, on that note, uh, as hinted at earlier, um, there will be a village council booth that is going to be at the corner of Maine and Burlington again? Yes. Yes. Uh, which is a great place to be. So if anybody has any questions or comments and want to come by and say hello or raise issues or share thoughts, it's also sort of a coffee with the council on steroids. And uh, I should have read the memo beforehand, but we will have the booth there on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? That's correct. Awesome. And uh, there will be some kind of a, uh, are we going to announce in, in advance who's going to be there when? Uh, we so could. that people can harass Commissioner Wallace and Commissioner Earl? Sure. <laughs> we can do that, yes. We don't have to, I was just asking. But, but all of us are, are signing up for, most of us are signing up for various shifts when we can. Um, some have uh, out of town plans, so we'll do it the best we can. Uh, but it's a good another opportunity to come by and, and see folks. Uh, so I look forward to seeing my colleagues there. And if you have any doubts about who a village council member looks like, you can see again, the uh, very svelte Commissioner Waldeck is modeling the official shirt tonight. <laughs> svelte? Yes, yes. Bless you. <laughs> I understand from NASA those shirts can in fact seen from space, so it should be really easy to pick us out of the crowd. Uh, so look forward to everyone, seeing everyone at Grow Fest, and uh, hope to have a good, safe time there. That's that's the end of my report. And that brings us to the attorney's report. Ms. Petrarca, good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Only one item to present this evening. That is an ordinance amending certain parking and traffic provisions. This item will be on July 10th. Activity. Outstanding. Thank you. And speaking of July 10th. That is our next regularly scheduled village council meeting. Because we're not going to have one on the July 4th. The 11th? Yeah. It's July 11th, sorry. Right. <laughs> that would be seven days from July 4th. Yes. Which is Independence Day. And how could I, a parade? And how could I forget to talk about the big parade? Because we don't have another meeting be between now and then either. Uh, so I also want to make sure that everyone comes out for the uh, Independence Day Parade, the annual Independence Day Parade that we have here in Donners Grove, which promises and has been billed and therefore will be bigger and better and bolder than ever. And Manager Fieldman, just some of the things that we're going to be featuring this year, such as more bands. Yeah, I will, <laughs> that's the main attraction. There's much, uh, many more uh, entertainment items, uh, more um, bands, more entertainment items throughout the parade. So I'm, I'm desperately looking for the we'll video. Listen, we've listened to some of the comments, and we're bringing it. It's going to be bigger, bolder, and badder than ever before. Um, just going on record here, so this can, can be communicated to all the uh, junior members of our community. I have, in fact, obtained a record amount of candy for this year's parade. <laughs> <laughs> Went way overboard. So we'll see how that works out. There's nothing worse than getting to the end of the parade route and about 2,000 kids give you that look. You're out of candy? <laughs> and then the parents are all doing this. You're out of office. It's really ugly. So you got to make sure you have enough <laughs> candy. It's very important. Thank goodness. You're term limited. Going to make sure there's enough for everybody. Candy. All right. So we got Rotary Grow Fest. We have the Independence Day Parade. Don't miss that. And we look forward to seeing everybody along the parade route. Um, with that, then, thank you, Madam Attorney. That brings us to item 11, council member reports. This is an opportunity for members of the Village Council to share with those who are in the audience and watching at home items of interest or other goings on in the community, although I've already covered the big ones. But there may be other things going on that my colleagues want to share, as well as any reports out from their roles as liaison in, liaisons in other uh, organizations or boards. So we'll start at my left tonight with Commissioner Barnett. I have no report, Mayor. Thank you. Commissioner Earl. No report. Commissioner White. No report. Commissioner Wallace. No report, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Waldeck. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a warning. Uh, Fourth of July, leave the fireworks for the experts. We talked about fires. I know in some neighborhoods it's like uh, the refilling of Saving Private Ryan. Uh, that would be your neighborhood primarily. <laughs> uh, you're right. <laughs> Which is why I mentioned it. So, yeah. Be careful with the fireworks. Uh, leave it to the leave it to the experts. Thanks. Thank you. The, the, the South Siders do have that down solid. 
Commissioner Jose. No report, Mayor. Thank you. All right. Very good. Thank you. And I know for the report either, which brings us to item 12, which is reserved for discussion of council member new business items. We have two on tonight's agenda, items 12A and B. Both of those items were brought to us courtesy of Commissioner Barnett. And as our custom uh, dictates, uh, we typically will ask for the propounding member of the village council, the sponsoring member of the village council to at least introduce those two items so that uh, we can then decide whether or not someone's going to make a motion. Well, Commissioner Barnett, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. So we've, um, we've been doing this new business process with uh, the introducing member making a motion uh, and then some ensuing discussion. There are two items tonight, and, um, and I'd, like to allow, I'd like my colleagues to allow me to, to read a couple of words beforehand because I want to talk about them together. Uh, they're both stormwater related, um, and I'll, I'll wrap up with making a motion on the first one, and then we can talk about it. But I'd like, I've got some comments prepared that, that sort of juxtapose the two together. So if you guys would indulge me, it's short. Um, the two items tonight, one talks about LPDA, uh, and one talks about uh, our ordinances as it relates to development and on-site detention. And the contrast, in my mind, on these two is, is striking. On the one hand, we prevent folks um, whose property might experience difficulty with flooding from remodeling or upgrading, for instance, their kitchens or baths, depending on the value. Um, even when those upgrades or improvements or investments have literally zero effect on flooding. And yet, on the other hand, we allow folks whose property is generally not in an LPDA um, to either build new construction or put additions on in such a way as to, in fact, worsen those conditions of their neighbors and flooding to their immediate neighbors. Um, that to me is, is just striking. Um, a person can't, depending on their elevation, they can't invest, reinvest in their own pro property to a certain level, and yet we're more than happy to allow those with a little higher elevation to make their lives a little worse. Um, that to me is a problem. In the first instance, the village has no real interest. Um, we don't ensure these. The ordinance seems to be modeled a lot after FEMA modeling or FEMA ordinances, but we're not actually in the business of insuring these properties or buying these properties, and so we have no real interest. We can say to somebody, literally, you can plate your fixtures with gold or you can bury a million dollars in your sump pit. As long as you don't pull a permit, we're okay. But if you pull a permit, we don't want you making an investment in your house, even when it has no effect on flooding, and I, I, I'm really struggling with that. It's also an interesting concept that it's not, there's no, there's no mechanism and structure for this thing to be indexed. A 2020 kitchen remodel is a lot different than a 2010 or a 25 or a 1995 kitchen remodel. And we've got a fixed dollar value limiting their investment. I think we're working against ourselves with trying to get our community to, to stay focused on improving their properties and maintaining them. With the second item, we've got a huge interest. The, 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 we've got an enormous interest when, when somebody takes and either builds a new house or remodels or adds on to a house in such a way as to increase the runoff from their site. We have two things. We have neighbors that have now got a beef and they're gonna be before us. And we've heard from them. We've heard from them regularly over the years. But we've also now likely assumed some additional burden on public infrastructure. We're gonna have to fix that at some point. It's gonna be part of our plan or not but it will be something that affects the decisions we make about those investments we make. In 2007, again in 2013, we went through a lot of effort, expended a lot of resources to figure out how to fix these drainage problems, how to properly prioritize things. In 13 or 12, we implemented a new utility just for this purpose. And yet, by allowing this, we say to folks, go ahead and make those problems worse. And so I think these two things are related to each other. That's why I introduced them this way. And I'd like us to consider then. So, Mayor, the, the first motion would be to direct staff to prepare an ordinance amending Chapter 26 of the Municipal Code to remove the investment limit for existing homes and LPDAs. Thank you, Commissioner. There is a motion on the table. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second, so I'll ask for discussion. Commissioner White. Well, first I want to say to Commissioner Arnett that I find both topics highly compelling. I believe we do need to talk about both, both, both of these topics, and, that, and, 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 and that's really understating the case because these two topics fit into a number of others. Item B is one of a great many suggestions regarding the impact of new, new, new development and runoff on, on, on the surrounding lots. The 
question is when and how, and typically to say that you want something as part of a long-range plan is sort of a way to kick the can down the road and say we'll get to it next Christmas. But at this point, um, I understand is that, is that we should be setting up our long-range plan in the next six to eight to ten weeks. I mean, so that we might very well get this on the agenda sooner, going through the long-range plan process, than we would as a traditional new business item. And because both items really are just two pieces, two very important pieces of a much larger puzzle, you know, I'm not inclined to vote in favor of the motion. I'm strongly in favor of us finding a definite time to dig into all of this and get it done. And you know, and now, now when, well, how that fits in with, with, with our other work is, is, is a question. So I, I, I don't want to downgrade or downplay the importance of the topic in, in, in any way. Um, but I'm not sure this should be run on a separate track because there's several other things too. So we need to get our work plan put together from now. We're actually behind what, what, what we've been in the past of putting our work plan together. So I think we'll be talking about when to do this in July, whether I vote yes or no this evening. We'll be talking about when to get this done at the same time as we would have, which, whichever way we go. Thanks, Commissioner. Other discussion? I agree with Commissioner White. And the motion, by the way, was for the uh, it was the LPDA oriented one. Yeah, it was correct. Just on the first one. Yeah. Commissioner Alzac. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Commissioner White's comments are interesting. I, I think they're more appropriately um, addressed to the second motion as opposed to the first. I think the second motion really would be the one that hasn't been brought yet. Correct. Um, so uh, gavel me on the order if you like, I guess. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I, that really is a larger conversation about, you know, what do what are our flooding concerns and how are we going to solve them? Now, I happen to think that the second motion is a very good way to go about solving them, but I think a larger conversation about all the different options is warranted. Uh, so that makes sense in the context, perhaps, of, of long-range planning. The, the motion that's on the table, I think, is much more discreet and easier to analyze and deserves uh, stronger and more immediate consideration. Thank you. Other questions on the motion that's on the table? Commissioner Barnett. I'd just say to that, to that first motion too that the, the village's interest is the reason that I think that something could be added, acted on immediately. The village has no real interest um, in this situation. When we impose this limit on investment, we don't further or diminish any village interest or public benefit. Um, that's where I think there's a, there's a distinction between the two and why this one I think could be done immediately. There's, there's no change. Any value to the village or the public by changing this thing right now? In, in response to that, um, I think there is a village interest. Um, now, because we're doing new business, there's been no staff report, we don't have the data to really discuss it yet. So I don't really feel comfortable getting into a debate as to whether the village does or does not have an interest. That's really what this is about, right. getting, more, getting right. more information. But unrelated to whether the topic is, 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 a, is a discrete topic, the type of information I'm going to want from staff to help me make a decision is going to be the same type of information I'm going to want to help decide B. Because I believe there is an interest. Um, you know, and and just you know, just my own little some digging into this. We talked about the, 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 the there was a house that appeared. The I won't give the address, so I get specific. There appears to be a house that was entirely within an LPDA that was allowed to be demolished and reconstructed. But apparently, and again, this is this is not confirmed. This is just a vague understanding that the design allowed the, the newly constructed house to be elevated above the LPDA, and there was no basement. So. The village does have an interest to avoid flooded basements. So to require homes with an LP, uh, LPDA to be built, to encourage homes with an LPDA when they're demolished or majorly reconstructed, to remove the basement, I think the village does have an interest because that will reduce the inc incidence of flooded basements throughout the community. Um, is it enough of an interest to continue the rule? I don't, I, I, I don't know yet. But as far as the timing of this, the information I want to be looking for it's going to be much of the same information I'm looking for on all the other topics. So rather than have staff prepare one report and then prepare another report, let's, do, let's just do it all together. Mayor, there's a technical question there. Um, there's a lot to the LPDA ordinance. And the dollar value investment limit is the only part that I'm questioning. 
and that does not impact right. the design as it relates to flood conditions, elevations, or site conditions. What this simply says is that if somebody wants to invest $100,000 in their upstairs, they can do it. it it's, we're not talking about, I mean, Commissioner Wright's exactly right. We have an interest, certainly, in, a, in controlling site development within an LPDA that might worsen the LPDA conditions, to be sure. I'm not questioning that at all. But there's a, sort of an arbitrary dollar value limit placed, and that's the question. Right, right. And, that, and that's actually where I see the distinction, because I think everybody's making very valid points. Um, and certainly with respect to the motion that has been made yet, I'm in agreement that that should be taken up as part of a larger, more comprehensive discussion. Um, so even though there hasn't been such said motion yet, I'm just telling you where, where I'm going to end up on that one. But on the one that's on the table with respect to the investment amount, uh, the reason why I see it as different than the larger discussion is that can be addressed within the current framework of our stormwater ordinance Correct. regulations and LPDA. We're not talking about changing the LPDA requirements. We're not talking about changing the stormwater regulations uh, to be more restrictive, less restrictive, or anything. Uh, that is a conversation we need to have. And I think it's a broader conversation that we need to have in a broader context. So I agree with that sentiment. But I think this is really about wh what does dollar amount have to do with achieving the objectives of our existing regulations? Forget about whether we're changing them or not. Uh, to me, it's somewhat like um, using a scale to try to determine something's temperature. Doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. I understand its origin, but frankly, it's not just that there's a, uh, a disconnect with the objective of our existing rules and regulations, which I think we should be trying to achieve, but it's also disconnect with an opportunity to encourage people to invest in their properties to bring them more consistent with our current stormwater regulations. And in some respect, we're hearing that we're preventing people from doing that. Um, so I see it as two different things. One is the, the investment criteria. Um, I would be supportive of getting more information about what staff might say would be um, useful or another way to achieve the same thing, being respectable of our current regulations and ordinances, both respect to localized poor drainage areas as well as stormwater, uh, without having sort of an arbitrary investment dollar amount, which is A, outdated, B, is disconnected, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and at this point, I think the request is simply to direct staff to get more information on that topic to propose some, some possibilities. And I do think that there could be more precise, tailored information that would be more helpful on that point that would not necessarily be, um, and maybe the staff report will prove me wrong, which is the other reason why I want to see it, uh, that it doesn't necessarily need to be part of the broader conversation. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is I need more information even to know whether you're right. Well, I, I do want to add a different, different aspect to this, though, because when, when I'm thinking about this, I see, from a policy perspective, I see parallels with the rules about reconstructing a house that's destroyed that has a non-conforming use. That my, my, my current understanding is, is, is that if there's a home that has an existing non-conforming use, it can remain. But if it's more than 50% demolished by a fire or tornado or, or windstorm, is that, is, 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 is that right? If, if it's more than 50% demolished, it can't yes. be rebuilt? Non-conforming structure. Non -conforming. It, non -conforming. Non -conforming structure. I mean, is it 50% of the structure or is it 50% of its value? 50% of the value of the structure. Of the structure, the value of the structure. And the policy goal behind such a regulation is to, over time, through attrition, re reduce the numbers of non-conforming structures within, within the village. And by preventing reinvestment in a home that violates an LPDA, that facilitates the goal of having that, that, that property redeveloped in a way that's above the LPDA floodline. If you allow them to reinvest in the property, you make it less likely that, that it'll eventually be redeveloped in such a way that it's no longer within the LPDA because of you can, you can, do, do, you can do, do things to re 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 reconfigure the lot. By putting more money into it, you make less likely it's going to happen. I'm not saying that that's, that that's going to be a sufficient justification for me to, to, to sustain that regulation in this case. But I do see that as there's a policy parallel there. And I also believe that we'll basically be asking staff to do a lot of duplicate parallel work. They'll do it for us now, and then when we get to the other issue, they'll do it then. And I just do it all at once. Well, actually, you just made the case in my mind that that's all the more reason we should do it, because then we'll have the benefit of it later, because you just convinced me they are the same policy decisions. So they're not going to be duplicative. Whereas the broader conversation goes to things such as, should we be more restrictive in terms of runoff, footprint, um, et cetera, et cetera, so we do not necessarily relate to this. So I guess all I'm saying is I, I don't want to have the debate right now. I'm not prepared to have the debate. I don't think I have the information necessarily to have the debate. 
Um, what I would like is I think I would benefit, and I think everyone might benefit from hearing staff's perspective on it, and it may be that their, their ultimate suggestion is, yeah, you know what, guys, you should all take this up as part of the broader conversation. Commissioner White's correct. And I just would just like to just, have that. Just one very, very, very fast comment. I oppose having this topic considered outside of the context of the prior prioritization of items through the long range plan. And if the long range plan was six months from now, well, maybe we got to make an exception. We can't wait that long. But within three or four meetings, we're going to have our long range plan done. And I don't want this item to have to be on a different train track as all the other items that, that, that are going to be part of the, the long range plan. Just as a practical matter, I don't see that happening. Okay. Mayor. Thoughts? But yes, I'm sorry. Commissioner Wallet. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I look at both these items, and if we ask staff to go get information, I think we wind up with a report that we already received. Uh, they, was it October of last year or something? Or where we had. That would be for item B, yes. That report's completed. Yeah, and I, I kind of look at. Both of these as, as similar, I'd rather take them up at the same time in a long-range planning session rather than address things piecemeal. <coughs> um, so I, I too would rather rather wait until long-range planning, uh, setting up a, a looking at the whole stormwater situation as, as one rather than doing things piecemeal. Yeah, you know, that's the way I feel about it now. Um, I'm not ready to move on on these right now anyway. So if we're going to go ask staff for information, it won't be long before we're going to get that information and start prioritizing. So I'd rather put it on the on the back burner for, for now. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Wallace. Yeah, I am going to echo that. I, I agree that both of these topics are extremely important. I would like to learn more um, about the motion that's currently on the table, but I think just in order to save staff time, resources, I would like to bundle these two together and do them all at once. Well, at least we know everybody wants to do them. Well, I think we all want to do them. <laughs> right. oh, yeah. it's a really, we're talking, it's a game of inches now. I've heard that before. Um, any, yes. <laughs> any other comments? I'll, I'll call the roll on, well, all right, any questions or comments in, from the audience? And I'll call the roll on the motion with respect to the investment um, limit in the current stormwater floodplain ordinance, please. Commissioner Barnett? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Wallace? Nay. Commissioner Earl? Nay. Commissioner Waldeck? Nay. Commissioner White? Nay. Mayor Tully? Aye. The motion fails four to three. Item number two, would you want to? I, I want to make the motion just because it's the right way to get a little bit more dialogue. Sure. Uh, so I move to direct staff to prepare an ordinance amending Chapter 26 of the Municipal Code to require on-site detention for new residential construction. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I, I feel like we've previewed this one already. Commissioner Barnett. Um, I, I, we did preview it, Mayor, and I, I appreciate your flexibility in the way that was introduced, uh, as well as my colleagues for jumping in and going I ahead. I think it was more efficient to do that. Now. Having the dialogue. Um, and, and certainly, uh, I, can, I can understand and, and count and hear what everybody has to say about timing on this. Um, let me just uh, remind everybody that, that that's, there's, there's logic to that. I'm certainly not going to argue with the, the fact that there might be some long-range planning value to this issue. I just remind everybody that this has been a subject that has been brought up in one way, shape, or form on this day is for about eight years. It was, as Commissioner Waldeck said, brought up last October. And what has transpired, at least in the last three, is another 100 parcels that have had situations where we've issued permits and we've made their, well, I shouldn't say all of them because I haven't studied them all, but in many cases, those conditions have made their neighbors' conditions worse. And so what we're saying, we may in fact have a bandwidth, that's probably an overused term, a list of priority action items that, that is longer than we can get done and when we probably need to collectively have a good conversation about what that list entails, this may or may not end up being one of them. I understand that. It is remains true that as long as this sits unanswered, we are saying to people that we are okay with recognizing, understanding the fact that when we issue permits, we in many cases are allowing neighbors to change to the detriment their neighbor's conditions. 
And that happens every time, not every time, happens in many of the cases where we radically change the profile of an existing parcel through redevelopment. So it, it's a real issue that can't just be kicked, it can't just be sort of interested in, and it's kind of an interesting idea, and maybe we'll get to it. That's been our tact for a while now. And every year that goes by, we are taking neighbors and pitting them against each other by not addressing this. So it's, I, I can respect the timing and the need to have a, a little more comprehensive review of staff workload, and, and I'm looking forward to doing that. Hopefully, as Commissioner White said, it'll be sooner rather than later. But that is what we're saying right now. We're going to continue to put off the idea that we want to stop what we know is a problem. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Jose. Thank you, Mayor. I don't necessarily want to repeat anything that was said, but um, you know, I, I happen to think that this is a, a very meritorious topic. I look forward to discussing it later. I'd be happy to discuss it further now, but it seems the majority doesn't want to go in that direction. Um, I think it's something that deserves a significant amount of discussion because you know, we, we took some good steps was about three years ago or so with the additional regulations requiring uh, rain gardens or other uh, type storage dry wells and um, it, it, was, it was useful in some places and others not because of the type of soil. And as a result, I think we need to start thinking about things exactly like this. Uh, our flooding problems are not going to go away. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Wallach. Uh, as I said before, I'd still like to include this on a, on a major topic of stormwater. I, I thank Commissioner Barnett for, for bringing this up. I did have some thoughts on, uh, on how uh, we can reduce the cost or address the cost of uh, site detention on, uh, on new properties, a way to go about it, and I'd like to bring that up when we have the general discussion and see how everybody feels. So that's another reason why I wanted to put this off. Thanks. Thank you. Other comments? I, I, I was just going to withdraw the motion, but go ahead, Mayor. Oh, Sorry. go ahead. Well, if you want, no, I, I was if you want to talk more about the subject. Say two things. I, I, actually, this one, I, I do agree we got to address it. We, a, we got to address it. B, we got to address it. C, we got to address it. D, we should address it as far as long range planning. But, but E, I'm going to make my little speech and get on my little spoke, soapbox here because we're talking about the regulations. And um, we're not, uh, the other thing we, we need to talk about as part of and as an extension of long range plan is the budget. And I will remind my colleagues that we have never, fully funded the stormwater utility uh, as was originally intended. It was designed over a multi-year period to be increased over time in order to phase in the funding that was determined some time ago as what was going to be necessary to actually make the operational capital and maintenance projects occur that take care of a lot of these issues. Now, it's related to Commissioner Barnett's uh, issue because obviously you don't want to create more problems, but we have an existing environment and landscape to deal with. And we have a long list of projects that can provide relief to this community. And again, every year we don't do it or we don't fund properly, we put off projects that also contributes to, the, to this issue. So it's the push-pull right there. And uh, the plan has been in place since the storm utility was adopted about what the funding was supposed to be. And every year everybody gets cold feet and the funding isn't put into place in, in the manner that it should be. Um, I would like to go revisit that plan when we come to the budget and actually put our money where our mouth is with respect to what we've all identified as a very important capital obligation of this, of this community. Uh, so I'm simply going to bring that up when we get to that point in time. But that's not a discussion we're going to have here tonight either. That'll be a discussion we have at the appropriate time. But that's, that's my little soapbox speech, which I give every year. And uh, anything further? All right, very good. Hearing nothing further, then we are at the end of our agenda. Oh, you're withdrawing the motion. I'd like to withdraw the motion, Mayor. And no objection. <laughs> Motion is withdrawn, so we don't need a roll call on that. Thank you for the discussion. Very important issues. That brings us to item 13. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Natalia, I move that this council adjourn. Second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Commissioner White? Aye. Commissioner Waldeck? Aye. Commissioner Wallace? Aye. Commissioner Earl? Aye. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Barnett? Aye. Mayor Tully? Aye. Thank you. We are adjourned. Good night. And we'll see you at Grove Fest. <laughs>